Welcome back to part four of the procedural rock tutorial series. This is part of the magic market series where we were responsible for creating the environment assets. So in the last part, I showed you how to bake out the displacement map and how to just basically apply it as a material. In this part, we want to improve that material. It's very basic at the moment, but what we're going to be doing is creating a material for the high res rock using that to bake out a diffuse for the low res rock. So let's begin. So from where we left off last, we can begin on creating a material for our rock. So we're going to apply this material to our higher res rock. And with that, we can output a displacement and a diffuse and roughness texture from our material network. So one thing to keep in mind is that this is dependent on how you would like to approach this and for what sort of rock you're going for. So, you know, a desert rock looks very different to one found in a forest. And so this is entirely dependent on how you would like to approach it, but I'm going to show you some techniques that I used to get mine looking the way that I wanted them. And so I'm going to show you the network that I created for the magic market setup. And it looked like this. So there was quite a lot going on in this one. Now I'm going to simplify it for what I'm showing you and mostly just focus on the important bits. For example, this up here is an extra piece that I added, which adds lichen. So that moss that grows in little patches on rocks. And over here, you know, I have stuff for moss and the moss displaces geometry as well. And when you output your displacement map, it also uses this, which is pretty cool. So. You know, with all of these little bits and pieces, you end up with a decent looking rock texture. And I'm going to show you more or less how I created it. So let's begin with a material network. And we're just going to keep this separate from the other materials. So we can call this materials, dive inside and drop a principled shader. We can call this rock underscore shader and then control B to make this full screen. So what we're going to start with is a few noises to add a bit of blotchiness to these rocks. We can go ahead and drop down some global variables because we will be needing things like position for our noise. And then we can drop down a unified noise static. Position into position of the noise. And then you can plug this into a ramp. This goes into the ramp and then you can make some adjustments to this unified noise. So we're going to change this from a simplex to something like a Wally. We're then going to do a fractal type of standard, change the offset and increase the frequency. We'll start with a frequency of 10 and we'll see how that looks. Cool. So we'll take this ramp and plug it into base color and we can rename this ramp node to base color. And over here, this ramp name, just change this to $OS. We're going to be doing this for all of our ramps so that the name that they inherit is the name of the node. So we can actually take a look at how this looks, control B to minimize this again. And we're going to put this onto our high res preview. So we can hide our display geo. And over here, we'll just grab that new material, which is made the rock shader. Now you might be wondering, why are we not doing it on the display geo? Because that is eventually where it's going to end up. Well, you'll see shortly that we're going to be using things like curvature and curvature on this is basically non-existent because it's a very smooth piece of geometry. However, the high res that we're using and what we're going to eventually bake it from has a lot of detail to it. So things like your curvature node pick up on that detail. And so you can use that to get really intricate detail in your diffuse and your roughness and then feed that back into your low res. So that's what we're doing. So over here, we now have our rock shader and I'm just going to adjust the camera so that it's focused on our rock. I'm going to take a look at how this looks in the render view. And you can see now that we have some blotchiness. Now let's go back in here and we're going to make a few changes. So just for now, we're going to set our roughness to about 0.9, quite a high value. And then we can decide on the changes that we want to make to this noise. Firstly, I don't think that I want it to just be black and white. I'd like this to be a dark gray and maybe a lighter blue gray. So I'm also going to add another point and make this one a much lighter color. Okay, so I think a ramp like that looks fairly decent. So I'm going to use that. And now we can start adding more detail to this. So perhaps we would like to mix the space color with a more green color. So there's patches of green. So to do that, 
we can actually just duplicate our unified static noise, duplicate our base color, and just switch these. So put your unified static 2 into your new base color, and we'll call this one down here tint color. We can then do a bit of a mix. So we'll do a color mix over here. We'll feed this base color into first input and the tint color into secondary. That can go into our base color. And then we need to make a few changes. So on our static noise, we'll change the offset, decrease the frequency, change the tint color. So let's make these shades of maybe brown and green. Then let's drop another unified noise down here, P, into the position, noise, into the bias. And this bias is what defines whether it's taking the first input value or second input value. So by driving it by a noise, you end up with a noisy distribution of the two. So we can use, once again, Worley Cellular. Once again, we'll do a fractal type, increase this offset to some wild value. But this time we'll decrease the roughness and decrease the lacunarity and also decrease the maximum octaves. So what this does is it basically keeps more of the original shape of the Worley and doesn't distort it as much. So we can increase the frequency to about seven. We'll see how that looks. And what this should do is give us patches of a more green tone. Great, so now you can see we have these green areas in certain spots and that just looks a bit more natural. So that looks pretty decent for our base color. I'm quite happy with that. So I'm going to rename this color mix to base color out. So this is just the base color node. And you can change this to a different color if you want. You can press C and maybe make this a red node. So you know that this one is one of your main nodes. Cool, now what else would we like to do? Well, it would be nice to have a bit of a curvature distribution so that certain edges of the rock are a different color. To do that, we can actually use the curvature node inside of our shader, just like this. So this one, as you can see, it has an input for P and for N, but by default, it actually just finds the P and N from the geometry that you're bringing in. So these aren't actually necessary to plug in. What we're going to do is do a bit of a mix. So once again, a color mix. And this is going to be our bias, right? So this over here will define what is first input and what is second input. And the other thing that we can do is drop a color correction node. So let's do a color correction and plug the base color into this color correction and then into secondary. And what we can do here is increase the value decrease the saturation, and let's also increase the gamma. So by increasing value and gamma and decreasing saturation, you end up with a desaturated gray or a whiter area, but not pure white, which is nice. So now we just need to set up our curvature node. So we're not going to be doing a concave scale, so you can switch concave scale and bias to zero. Our tolerance will do 0 0.1, and our convex scale will drop this quite low. So 0.01. So firstly, tolerance defines what constitutes an edge. So we're including more of a particular area to be considered an edge. Convex scale defines how convex a certain area has to be for it to be considered convex. So convex would be edges, concave would be divots. So if we go ahead and render, you should see quite an interesting look now. So as you can see, we're ending up with different colors towards the edges. Now to better see this, what we can do is disconnect our color correction and just use the secondary color and make it something bright that is easy to see. So something like red. Now, as you can see, it's picking up much more than just our edges. So to fix this, we can change this from a space of zero to one to minus one to one. That will give us just these edges. And from here, you could increase your convex scale to 0.02. That will give you a lot more of this red. And then you can put your color correction back into secondary and you'll have much lighter edges. So you can now see that certain edges are a lighter color. And you can even break this up by using another noise. So the main secret to this is just repeatedly using noises to break up any sort of repetition or anything that appears too obvious or unnatural. So once again, a unified static into position. This time we'll use 
a value noise alligator and we'll multiply our curvature by that. So just multiply over there. And so as you can see, there's now only two small areas that have that sort of pattern. That's because this noise is zero in most areas. So it's actually canceling it out. What we can do here is just increase frequency. We'll do about four or five. And we're not getting much of a noise going on. So we can actually switch this to Perlin and Perlin seems to give us much better results. So that looks pretty good. Now we don't have to stop there with curvature. What we can do is do the reverse of our curvature. So once again, taking a curvature node and we can also duplicate this color mix, feed in our curvature as the bias over here. This time we want the reverse. So any areas that are inset, we'd like there to be some sort of darker area, maybe like moss or dirt that gathers in the crevices. So to do that, we're going to still be using convex, but we'll increase the scale to about 0.05. And if you want to just display this to see exactly what this curvature looks like, you can feed it straight into your base color. This is a float, so it'll come out as black or white. And so what we're interested in are these black areas. So it looks decent. So a value of black over here when fed into color mix will return the first input. A value of white will return the second input. So all we have to do is change the first input to be darker. That way all of these black areas will be darker for us. So let's once again drop down a color correction node, plug it into the first color mix this time. Over here we can slightly decrease the gamma and value and then plug that into the base color. And if we give that a render we can see how that looks. Ah, and of course, we don't want our second input to be the light color correction. We want it to be this color mix over here. There we go. And once again, I'm just going to copy over this multiply and this noise. So over here, curvature into first input, noise into second input. All we have to do on this one down here is change the offset so that they don't match and then use this instead as your bias. Great, so we're getting lots of interesting little details in our rock. So we can also ramp our curvature to control our roughness. So if we just take our curvature into this ramp and we can rename this to roughness ramp. And once again, changing the name to $OS, we can multiply this. We can multiply its input by another unified static noise, once again, offsetting it a bit, plugging that into the second input of the multiply. And then in here, we won't be using complete black and complete white because we want our rock to generally be close to a uniform roughness. So we'll do a color of this gray over here and perhaps this gray over here, maybe a bit more of a difference. So something like that plugged into roughness. As you can see, that lower end is actually quite shiny. So you can increase that. And doing that, you can just play around with the roughness and the variation of the roughness. But I think that looks decent. So the only other thing that we really want to do with this is maybe just add some moss. So let's add some moss to this rock. And to do that is actually quite cool. So I'm going to disconnect our base color over here. And we can actually just once again make this node show up as an important node. You can rename this one to Rock Diffuse Detail. And once again, we can just make that red. And we can do the same for our roughness, which is spelt incorrectly, actually. Roughness over here. Let's make this red as well. Okay, so we know which nodes control most of our work. So we're going to need normals. Now, we can grab it from those global variables over there, but I actually like to just add another one right over here. You can also bind it in, and that's perfectly fine as well. Just going to have one over here where I call in N. And we're going to use a vector to float. What we're going to do with this is we're going to take the n value and split it into its three components. Because we want to know what is the top face of the rock so that we can add mass to the top of the rock. So we know that the y axis is the second value. It would be x, y, and z. So second value is what we're looking for. Let's just drop a ramp parameter, second input into the ramp parameter, and we can rename this to mass ramp. So mass ramp, just like that. 
And what we can do over here is change this to green like this and plug this into our base color. Now, before we continue, I want you to be aware of something. Normals go from minus one to one. Any normals pointing down would be minus one. So what we actually want to do is fit this range from minus one to one to a range of zero to one because we want the downward facing points to be considered a value of zero. And in the middle, it would be a value of 0.5. At the top would be a value of one. So I'm going to first show you the render and you can see what this means. And if you find that your renders are taking long, you can also disconnect the roughness because the curvature nodes take quite long to calculate. Okay, so we can see what we have now. We're going to drop a fit. So we just fit range in this vector to float and we go from minus one and one to zero and one. And it works quite intuitively now. You can see that most of the downward facing points have this black applied to them and all of the top facing points have the green applied to them. So we can just keep shifting this. And that looks like a decent distribution, maybe even higher on this end, but it's all right. So what we're going to do is set the upper value to be white because we're not going to be using this as our mask color, but as our controller. So we're going to drop down a color mix and we'll put our rock diffuse detail into primary and we'll drop our ramp into the bias. And by default, the secondary color is purple. If you want to visualize this, you can switch it to green, feed that into base color. So now you can see we're using this mass ramp to mix between our existing color and the second input of our color mix. So now, of course, we want to make something that looks like moss. And once again, we'll be using noises for that. So we can just stop this over here. Control B to bring up our network. And let's go ahead and drop down another unified noise. Unified noise static. You can grab the position over here. Plug it into the position in your unified noise. We're going to feed this into a ramp parameter. This ramp parameter we can rename to mass color. And then we want to do $OS. And this other one, we didn't do $OS. So we can just go back and do that there. $OS. And then we can take noise into mass color and mass color into the second input over here. So this noise over here, we can use a very high frequency and we'll leave it as simplex. We can also do an offset. And once again, we can duplicate this noise. This second one, we can set to Worley Cellular with a fractal type of standard, decrease the frequency, and then multiply these two noises together. That will go into mass color, and mass color, we just want a nice range of colors. So we can just choose some desaturated colors. That will probably look good as mass. So let's take a look at something like this. Control B, and let's see what this gives us. And so you'll notice that we're mostly getting this lower end, and that's just because we're multiplying two low value noises together. You can either fit both of these to a different range, or you can just move these closer to the lower end. And so that works decently well. We have some interesting mass color over here, but it's very apparent that our mass is flat. So the next thing that we want to do is use this to actually displace our geometry. So we're just going to drop a mix node. What we're going to do is feed our mass ramp, which is the black and white mask, which tells us where our mass is, into the bias. And if there's mass, we want to raise it. All right, we want to raise it and give it displacement. So we just tell it how much displacement we want. We'll do 0.01 for now. And then we can feed that blend into displacement. So not vector displacement, just displacement. And it won't work unless you go over onto your principal shader, over to displacement, and then say enable input displacement. If we give the surrender, it's not going to look amazing, but you will notice the displacement. So you may be able to see that there's some very slight displacement wherever we have mass. Now that's decent, but we'd like to make a few changes to this. Mass generally isn't so flat. So what we can do is on this mix node where we have our input to just middle mouse and click on constant. That will expose the node that controls the second input. We can then multiply it by a noise and drop a unified noise static. So just plug the P value once again into the position of your noise. This time we want a very fine noise. So we're going to switch this to value noise fast with a very high frequency. 
So we'll go to close to 100 on frequency, feed that into the multiply. And what this will do is multiply this value that raises our geometry by a noisy value. So there'll be a lot of distortion to the displacement and it will add what looks like bumpiness to our mass. So that should be good. We can just press Control B to minimize that window and then render again. So it looks decent, but we can increase the frequency to about 120, maybe even higher to 130 or 40. And the other thing I'm going to do is make some changes to the base color. And we can take a look at how this looks when rendered as well. Now, of course, you can use a bump map for this. Um, that would probably be the preferable way of doing this. But for simplicity's sake, I don't want to have to still create a bump map. So we're just going to focus on diffuse, roughness and displacement. So if you don't want that displacement for whatever reason, you can remove it, but it's up to you. So I'm going to drop this value a bit lower and then make the final changes to the setup. So once again, this color mix can now be called Rock Diffuse Final. This down here can just be called Moss Displace. Once again, make them red. And what I'd like to do is add a bit more brightness to our moss. So maybe just an in-between point. That's a lot more saturated. And I'll also go over and change the base color ramp to something with a bit more variation. And also give the tint color a bit of a better shade, just like that. And then just, you know, rotate around our scene a bit to set up the light for this rock. There we go. We have our first procedural rock and maybe this doesn't look like a rock, but we do have everything in place to make rocks. We can increase faceting, we can change colors, we have full control over what we're creating and it's entirely procedural. So in the next part, we're going to take this entire setup and we're going to feed it into tops so that we can generate our diffuse and our displacement, output it, apply it to geometry that's automatically generated inside of our tops net, and then put them all into a variant to be used by USD. So that's coming up in the next part. I hope to see you there. I hope you've been enjoying this tutorial so far. If you have any questions or concerns or any feedback, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try to get back to you. So see you next time. Bye.